morning. Good morning. Can you all hear me okay? Yes. Okay. Thanks for coming to the Desert Zen Center this morning. Uh, Roshi, uh introduction is uh, quite a good challenge. Uh, so there's a lot to Buddhism, but if you are new to it, I think it's probably best that you just learn about, or in the case of some people, be reminded of the life of the Buddha. Because our practice here uh, centers around that. Uh, because he is the teacher. And his life is the life that we uh, turn to when we look for insight and direction and help with our practice. Uh, an understanding of his life uh, informs his teachings. And so I'll try to really just Hit the high points, if you will. Uh, he was born, the Buddha was born, Siddhartha Gautama was born 2,600 years ago in northern India. Uh, he, uh, his family was well to do. Uh, today, uh, is uh, kind of a 1% kind of a person. Uh, his family uh, 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 was a part of the Shakya clan. Uh, that's where his Buddha name comes from, Shakya Muni Buddha. Uh, and the Shakya clan is the warrior clan. The warrior clan and the royal clan. So they were the rulers and the, the uh, fighters that uh, uh, kept the peace and the, the civil order in northern India. His father was, uh, uh, some, some say that his father was a king, a, a noble person. Uh, others kind of put him into a category of a, uh, a governor or some official in, uh, of that order. But quite a powerful uh, man, uh, quite a, uh, uh, an important individual in his, in his world. And his world, to give you a context of uh, the size of his world, India is a huge country. Uh, the area that some historians claim that the Buddha's father administered or ruled over was uh, about 2,000 square kilometers. Now, what does that translate to anything we might know or understand here? A uh, little research, and I found out that 2,000 square miles is the equivalent of about 790, 2,000, 2000 square kilometers, about 790 square miles. And that's very close to the size of Orange County, California. So when you want a context for uh, you know, his uh, geography, if you will, northern India, a province about that size in the foothills of the Himalayas. Uh, he uh, was born into this royal family, uh, as was the custom in the time. His father uh, 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 gathered together the area's most prominent uh, fortune tellers and soothsayers, and uh, they came to two conclusions after looking at the boy uh, after his birth, and one that it would, he would be a great ruler or a great spiritual man. Great in spirituality or great as a ruler. And his father, uh, because he was his only son, uh, had, uh, obviously had some things in mind for him right away, which was to make sure he was trained and given all the tools he would need to take over his kingdom. Uh, and so he was given, he, he was presented with the best teachers, uh, he had very many other, uh, uh, so uh, uh, many other royal friends. Uh, they had a some sort of compound where they would uh, 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 rule from, if you would. Uh, 
and this was kind of the path his father put him on. Uh, and uh, his father was, uh, there's a lot of uh, thinking about, well, why, why is his father so protective? One reason his father was so protective is that the Buddha's mother, Queen Maya, passed away within a week or two of his birth. And so he was raised by an aunt, Prajnapati. She was his stepmother. So you can see kind of the setup here is that we need to uh, protect this young man and nurture him and make sure he becomes a great ruler. And this all went really well. But the Buddha was a pretty sensitive individual. It had a lot of, I believe, uh, an inclination towards compassion and awareness of the situation of others because he had a couple of opportunities where he went outside the gates of the royal compound. Uh, the story is that he was driven by his charioteer. And out there, he saw some things that were that he'd never seen in a royal in the royal setting where he grew up. There was a, a man on the side of the road who was obviously very ill, and he could he asked the chariot driver, what, what is this? Uh, and the chariot driver told him that this is a condition of life that the people who live in your community deal with. Uh, he saw a, an individual who was bent over and moving with great difficulty down the road. He asked, what, what, why, I don't understand this. And he said, well, that's the effect of old age. E everyone must deal with the effects of old age. And uh, so uh, then he, he saw a deceased body off to the side of the road. And the, the charioteer informed him that that was the fate for everybody and that uh, it, it was uh, something that we uh, you know, had evidence of right here. This individual has passed on. And then the story goes that he saw a, a, a wandering uh, uh, seeker, a, a mendicant, a shravaka. Mm -hmm. uh, these individuals uh, were uh, quite prevalent and popular at the time. It was, this was a popular undertaking in Indian culture at the time to uh, uh, either as a young man or most likely as an older and more experienced individual to take care of your family, then set them up in your advanced years and then wander off into the forest seeking spiritual enlightenment or uh, c c coming to, to find the answer that you've got for your life, the, 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 the answer that answers the question of your life. Um, and so he saw this individual and saw all this suffering and uh, was a bit concerned because his father was pretty adamant about how things were going to go. They found an appropriate wife from a nearby village, so it was a smart marriage because it strengthened the family and the clan. Uh, the Buddha was married at not a young age for the time, but by our means, fairly a young age, like a, 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 a middle to later teenager. He had a, uh, he had, and his wife had a son. And all these events kind of, I'm sure, made his decision difficult because his decision was that he needed to find uh, an answer to his question. And his question is at the root of our teaching, his teaching, the teaching we follow. And his quest in life was his question of wondering why people suffer. Why is there this suffering in the world that causes us to be unhappy? What, what, what is the cause of that? And even more important, I think, to him was what can 
I do to help people deal with these circumstances that I see all around me. So he, with a heavy, heavy heart, he left his bride and his new son, and, uh, uh, and that's a harsh thing, no doubt, and a tough decision to make. It was only somewhat softened by the fact that his family took care of them in the manner of a princess and her child in the royal sort of circumstances that they were in, in their, 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 their realm. And uh, he uh, left the family's compound. The chariot driver drove him out to the edge of civilization, the middle of nowhere the woods. Uh, he asked for the chariot, uh, charioteer's sword. He cut off his hair. That's an important thing because your hair designated your caste. And so that was a way, that, that's what seekers did at the time. Uh, they got rid of all their, their clothes, their finest clothes. He gave those to the charioteer, told him to take them back to his family. Uh, and that uh, 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 that he would be he would be fine, and they would be in his thoughts. But he had to go do this this quest to find the answer to his question. And at the time, the prevailing religious doctrine of the era was Brahmanism, and it's it's a a root of what we call today Hinduism. And the idea within Hinduism that was key to the story here is in Hinduism, in order to uh, uh, achieve enlightenment or, or uh, 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 a quest for uh, wisdom or a, a union with the divine, one had to subjugate the body. The body was the barrier to one's spiritual development. So there were a lot of the, a lot of guys out in the woods. He originally worked with two meditation masters to learn how to still his mind, how to make an inquiry about his mind, how to make connections with his practice as it grew and his thoughts as they began to come deeper and deeper. And he was quite proficient at, at these meditations that he was learning, to the point that both the teachers he studied with uh, asked him, hey, why don't you take over from me? I'm kind of thinking about retiring, and you get this, so you'd be the perfect guy for this. And he thought about it, and 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 uh, told both of them that the, you know the his that was lovely and he appreciated their faith in him but his that the, these meditation techniques did not really seem to help him get at the answer that he was looking for his question about why we suffer. He spent seven years out in the forest uh, with. <clears throat> No clothes, uh, you know, uh, a, a loin cloth, uh, a, a handful of rice a day, and extreme ascetic principles he applied. And they almost killed him. He got very, very close to expiring uh, out in the forest, and a, a herder, Sujita, a girl herder, uh, uh, saw him and saw the, uh, uh, the, his condition for what it was and said, made the observation that uh, the, the Buddha is dying. And she gave him a bit of goat's milk and some rice gruel, uh, had her family, her mother help her nurse the Buddha back to health. And out of this experience of 
uh, over seven years, he uh, he came, he, he came to the idea of something which is his first teaching called the middle way. And it is, you know, a lot of good common sense proven by his experience, which is, you know, don't, what, what, be careful of these extremes in behavior and thought and action and look for the, the bountiful smart spot in the middle because that's where you're going to find, you're most likely to find the answers to your questions. Not in these extremes on the edges of things. Try to be mindful and pull those things into a place that are not so inflammatory on one side or give you so much uh, uh, problems on the other side. So <coughs> charting this course down the middle, the middle way. He got healthy and then he began to seriously apply his meditation techniques to answering his question. In Buddhism we call that his koan. His koan, his question in life. Why do we suffer? Why? Why? How can we, why do we suffer and how can we be happier? How can we move past that? And he had a, uh, an awakening, if you will, uh, 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 when he sat for a period of a day and a night consistently. And uh, at, at this, uh, just before sunrise, uh, he saw a, uh, a, uh, either the planet Venus or something, or a shooting star. There was some sort of a moment where he was able to break through, uh, you know, have an understanding and an answer to his question. Uh, and his fourfold, the, the four noble truths that he gives us are that we, from time to time we're unhappy. Suffering exists. What can we do? What's the cause of that suffering? Because that leads us to the second noble truth. And he he taught that the cause of suffering is craving. We want things to be one of two ways, but in both cases different than they are right now. We want things to be better than we are because we're unhappy with the way they are, or we don't want them to ever change. They're so great, I'm going to be unhappy with the fact that I'm probably likely from, from my observation to understand that they might change in the future. Well, this dichotomy between uh, uh, the, uh, the idea of uh, craving or denial or pushing away of some other thing uh, uh, is the second noble truth. The third noble truth is that there is a a way to see into this situation as it is and cause our suffering to cease and allow us to become happier, that's tied to the meditation that he was doing and that we do in our practice. That's a key element of what helps us see into the nature of the three other noble truths, the two other noble truths. The fourth noble truth is the introduction of his other idea, very important idea, the Eightfold Path. The Eightfold Path helps us in our lives to be happier because it makes sure that we make sure that other people are happier and don't suffer. So the first one is right view. Right view has a lot to do with the Four Noble Truths and understanding the nature of suffering and craving and our relationship to those things. That by and large, those are things that we think of. And if we pay attention to our meditation, 
we see pretty quickly that those thoughts that came into our mind that we thought were so important, were so real, caused us so much pain and suffering, over time dissipate. They go away. Our thoughts arise and fall away. That's right view. Those are the views of, that the Buddha taught in the, in the Four Noble Truths. Right intention, right intention is to, to foster and, and be dedicated to a practice that helps us be happy and by following the path of the Buddha. Right speech, right speech is tied to another thing I'll talk about just a little bit later, but we don't want to say things to hurt people, right? Our, our, our voices are quite powerful, especially if we're not mindful of what we're saying to, to people and, and making sure that we, uh, we pay attention to their feelings and be mindful of, of how what we say might affect them. Right action, that's the fourth, no, uh, the fourth of, on the eightfold full path. Right action, right? Taking action when we see it's important to take action to alleviate people's suffering. So being tuned into our world and what's happening and wondering in a mindful way, how can I help out? What can I do to help this situation become a better situation for the, the person or circumstances that I'm presented with. Uh, the, the right, uh, uh, the next, uh, the next on the Eightfold Path is right livelihood. So, uh, you know, don't take a job that you're probably going to hate anyways that, that really doesn't help you understand your true nature and probably, you know, pulls you down. Have a job that you enjoy, that when you can, help others, including your coworkers, and your customers, and, and all of the people who you might run into in your, during your day at work. Uh, the, uh, the next noble truth is right effort. So, you know, give your practice, strong effort, uh, try to develop a meditation practice where you sit and be calm and quiet for just a minute or two. And then try to do a little bit more. Be comfortable in your, in your body. Be calm in your mind. Find some ease in your breath. And see what happens. Because if you do that, you'll, you'll develop. That's the way to develop a, a, a practice uh, uh, that ties into this idea of what the Buddha is teaching. Uh, then the, the, the uh, after right effort is right mindfulness. So this, this kind of covers the whole waterfront, if you will, because we're, if we're, we're in meditation and we're cultivating this idea of mindfulness, which is keeping attention on our thoughts in meditation, the next step is to move that discriminating mind to our lives, to, to our lives as we move through our lives in real time. Uh, and then right consciousness, which is kind of the highest level of mindfulness. The, the kind of mindfulness that creates uh, an incredible sense of joy and compassion in our lives that radiates throughout the, the, our world. So those are the, that's the Eightfold Path. And to, to kind of wrap up, I guess, I just want to uh, uh, talk about one other thing, and, and that is uh, becoming a Buddhist. Uh, becoming a Buddhist, 
you you take the three jewels, which are the also known as the refuges, right? Where you there's a little bit of a ceremony where you uh, vow to take refuge in the Buddha, take refuge in the Dharma, which is the teachings of the Buddha, and to take refuge in the Sangha, which is all of us in this room. And then, to kind of keep grounded and, and give you a little more to work with in the context of the Eight Noble Truths, is at the time you take the three jewels, you also take the five precepts. The five precepts are not to kill. I gotta get these. <laughs> not to kill. <laughs> not to speak ill of others. Uh, not to commit adultery. Uh, not to become intoxicated. Not to steal. Not to kill. Not to steal. Not to steal. Thank you. <laughs> not to steal. Not to take that which is not given to you. Um, I think I've covered just about everything I wanted to cover. It's a lot, I know, but it's 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 good to to know. Because, you know, if you have further questions, certainly you can ask us. If you, There's a billion, jillion books. One other thing, at the end of this service, the other thing is to please join us in chanting. I don't know if you have chant books, but please <coughs> join in. There is a lot of useful spiritual information in our chanting. Uh, and uh, so join us uh, with the, the chanting. And please join us after the service because we will uh, give you the opportunity to offer some incense to the Buddha, uh, the Buddha who uh, is our teacher and who uh, gives us so much in our lives. Thank you so much.